Hello, everyone. It's great to be with you again. I want to talk about wound healing today, using cannabidiol and how it benefits uh, the wound healing process. I've been exploring a number of the pathophysiologic changes as well as the benefits that can come about as a result of using cannabidiol. So I'm excited to relate some of these things and a, a few revelations that I've had along this pathway. Now today we're going to talk about the burden of disease in terms of wounds. I'm going to focus on chronic wounds because that's where we have a lot of evidence. And there's a lot of information about it. We'll talk about the conventional treatment, endocannabinoid deficiency that occurs in wounds as well as many other diseases, and evidence for cannabidiol providing benefits in wound um, healing. I'll talk about some of the serving sizes and the management of patients with wounds, and we'll have some question and answers at the end. So the wound spectrum is quite broad, and usually we talk about wounds and we think of wounds as on the skin, but in fact, those wounds can occur anywhere. And so I think I want you to keep in mind that we're talking about wounds that occur in any part of the body, whether it's the cornea or it's on blood vessels, or it's on internal organs, such as the gut. Anywhere where there is a wound, there's a break in the continuity of surface, then uh, there is uh, healing going on, and cannabidiol has a potential for healing those areas. Now, the impact, uh, particularly with healing, has to do a lot with vascular um, changes, vascular ulcers, with pressure type of ulcers, and diabetic ulcers. We're, we're really looking at quite an epidemic that's coming up with our aging population. If you look at some of the statistics, it just as looking over the entire country of the U.S., so we're talking about at least $25 billion is spent, and this was recorded in 2009 in terms of these amounts. Uh, so it's quite a bit more. There's a 6.5 million people suffer uh, from chronic wounds, and there's a 7% mortality associated with having um, a chronic wound of any type. Each hospital stay, it was averaging about 13 days for any type of chronic uh, wound, and 25% of all diabetics come down with a chronic wound. If you estimate the number of diabetics in our country at about 10%. You can talk about 30 million people, and then 25% of that is, is you're going to have on the order of 7 or 8 million people who are going to have this problem during their course, during their lifetime. Not only that, and the terrible tragedy is the 12% of amputations that may be associated with chronic wounds. Now, I use chronic wounds as a parameter because it's a good objective measurement that we can look at. I'm going to be talking about all kinds of wounds, both acute wounds, um, intermediate wounds, as well as chronic wounds. Um, my focus is going to be on wounds of all types, and we'll go through some of the physiology right now. There are four phases of wound healing, and, and they can be divided up in different ways, but you can clearly see there's a significant deal of overlap, and that overlap uh, plays a role in a lot of the signals that are going on within the body. Now, a chronic wound is considered anything that lasts beyond three months that doesn't show significant signs of healing. Um, so the, the final area in terms of remodeling or maturation is really is a part of the strengthening of the wound. Um, and we're going to be focused on the first three areas with the main topic, looking at inflammation and the signals that are going on. Now, that's not to say inflammation is all bad, because we actually do need inflammation to make uh, the healing process occur properly. So during the hemostasis phase, uh, sometimes called the, uh, the early phases or the acute phases um, of uh, inflammation, actually, when the body is damaged, it's going to cause some vascular restriction. Uh, there is going to be a release of um, plasma material. Um, there's fibrin. It's going to fill into the wound area. Thrombus is going to form. Those produce a number of signals to the body as a positive inflammatory signal to recruit uh, macrophages that are going to help 
in the healing process. And so in this sense, the endocannabinoid system and the signaling of this type of inflammation is beneficial. So we need inflammation a little bit, but not a huge amount. We've got to keep that under control. Then during the inflammation phase, we've got the neutrophil infiltration, the monocyte, and the macrophage, as well as the lymphocyte. They have to protect us from infection. But on the other hand, they've got to protect us. They've got to uh, remove some of, uh, produce some of the inflammation to stimulate other the processes, but they won't, don't need to go too far. And that may be the problem with chronic um, wounds is that they set up an inflammation that doesn't subside. The body's constantly in an inflammatory state. And then in the proliferation phase, you've got the putting uh, the re-epithelialization as well as the blood vessel formation and the collagen strengthening along this process. And in addition, there is other tissue or extracellular matrix that's going to be included. And then the remodeling has to do with the collagen and vascular maturation to make that area tough again and get it back to as normal as it can be. When we look at the hemo stasis phase where you have tissue damage occurring, where that scalpel enters into the body, there are bacteria and, the, and there's the signals and, and that go into the body to um, cause the release of chemotactic factors, those things that will invite um, the macrophages and the cellular systems that will help protect us against infection. At the same time, it signals um, increase in blood flow and capillary uh, permeability. So there's a lot of leakage going on. And with that permeability, it allows for the white blood cells and the macrophages to get into the area so they can clean up the mess or the bacteria or the injured material cells that are, have been damaged. Now, that permeability uh, provides for a lot of the swelling that occurs in an area as well as cellular contents. Then the, the phagocyte, phagocytites and uh, the antibacterial uh, agents and um, uh, lymphocytes will um, destroy the bacteria by some of the ability that they have, particularly some of the cytokines that they have. And the macrophages will migrate to the site of inflammation. And so where they're released from the capillaries, they're going to congregate into a particular area where that wound is and where that inflammatory signal is calling them. Now that's important and I'll show you why. So in the inflammatory phase, uh, what we have is this uh, these tissue um, macrophages that are coming into the area of the wound. And these are the perpetrators of a lot of the inflammation and a lot of the signaling that's going on, both for benefit as well as damage and problems. And so the macrophage is producing, and the, the activated macrophage is producing a lot of irritating substances and a lot of chemotactic substances, things that are going to recruit other cells like itself so that they can do the work that is required. But in addition, those macrophages have the ability to release factors that are toxic to the bacteria, but they can also be toxic to the normal blood cells and the normal tissue in the area. So we need to control that. We need to keep that under in a balanced and a modulated phase, not too much and not too little. If we look at the cytokines, and these are the signaling molecules that are released from the macrophages that stimulate both the recruitment of lymphocytes as well as uh, producing killer cells and inducing a number of the anti you know, the, the cytokines that are so irritating and, as well as um, inducing an, a number of these positive effects. So these are the signaling molecules. And you're well familiar with uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha that is a part of what we see in inflammatory bowel disease. But this occurs everywhere in the body. And the macrophages use this as a signaling agent to call in that uh, changes in the uh, endothelium to the vascular permeability um, to the release of uh, complement as well as antibodies uh, to the area. It's also going to do some increase in fluid drainage uh, to the lymph nodes. And, and you've got the whole body being orchestrated much like a symphony in order to make this process work and work smoothly. 
So then during the proliferative phase, you've got the endothelialization that occurs, angiogenesis, collagen, and then the matrix that fills in. Pretty straightforward uh, in, in this proliferative, proliferative phases. But what I want to point out is that during chronic wound formation, you have a suspension of this phase. And in an inflammatory environment, this process, this proliferative phase and the and of the, the final healing does not occur. And it's suspended until that inflammatory situation has calmed down enough so that this phase can go into being. My theme here is that the endocannabinoid deficiency dysfunction is very prominent in a wide variety of conditions, whether it's diabetes or whether it's uh, circulatory disorders or just trauma. We're seeing this in a broad range of conditions such as PTSD, cystic fibrosis, multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease, all over the map in terms of what's being found. There are literally thousands of studies to show correlations with the endocannabinoid dysfunction with high levels of cannabinoids and low levels of receptors or vice versa. So there's a, an imbalance that's occurring that sets people up and diabetics are particularly prone uh, towards that type of problem. There's a clinical deficiency of the endocannabinoids that is uh, common in all of these disorders. And if you can identify it, we don't have yet the tools to identify this easily, but in the future, we hope to be able to identify where those deficiencies are. But until then, we have a pretty good idea that there is a dysfunction that's occurring, we've got to find, we've got to rebalance the endocannabinoid system, and we're likely to be able to heal the process and improve the function of the body by doing that. If we look at the problems related to wounds, then we're talking about where's the evidence for endocannabinoid dysfunction uh, in uh, wound type of um, situations. So we've got several pieces of evidence. Now, one is uh, this uh, cannabinoid receptor type 1. It mediates the, down sig the signaling of the down regulation of the expression of keratins in, the, and the, uh, in vitro and in, in situ. So what we're talking about here is the proliferative phase uh, of wound healing, where the cannabinoid type 1 receptor is very closely involved with this process. And in the second quote that I have there, the hyperglycemia diminishes expression of CB1, uh, as well as enhancing that of uh, TRPV1. These types of receptors are involved with the pain and inflammation that goes on within the body. And the TRPV1 is part of the endocannabinoid system, although it's not officially uh, been designated as an endocannabinoid receptor. It's very closely involved. And this study showed that there was particularly overlapping of the CB1 and the TRPV uh, receptors. And so a protein actually joined between the two uh, to uh, downregulate the inflammatory area of the TRPV1 so that um, it was not as prominent. And that, as a result, would reduce uh, some significant amount of the pain as well as the over-inflammation. But primarily, we're actually seeing that CD1 is very much involved in the uh, inflammatory signals that are involved with the healing uh, in wounds uh, of all natures. And so we, ex see, we expect to see a activation of CD1, uh, but on the other hand, we need to have the CB1s in the right population and the right concentration in order to have a modulated effect. If they're way too few, then you're not going to get the healing effects that you would expect. Cannabidiol has specific actions both in the vasculature, the immune modulation, and it prevents cell damage. It prevents cell death. And so you have tissues that are involved with both the heart, uh, the lung, uh, and the brain that um, go through a process of apoptosis when they're under a great deal of stress. And cannabidiol can protect those organ systems, but it protects individual cells in uh, the wound area as well. There's uh, fibrosis and collagen is balanced and modulated. I really like to use the word modulated because cannabidiol is not pushing just in one direction. 
it's really balancing the other hormones, the other substances that are there to make the body, to have the body do its own uh, physiologically balanced approach uh, to these types of problems, whether it's a disease or an injury. In addition, cannabidiol is actually regulating, well, the endocannabinoid system is regulating pain, hunger, and stress. And what we see with cannabidiol is that it modulates pain, it um, balances hunger, and it relieves the uh, physiologic stress as well as the cellular stress that's going on as a result of an injury as well as a disease. And finally, we're seeing cannabidiol restore the endocannabinoid system. So it's lifting up the entire system and balancing it so that the body can maintain homeostasis and maintain a healthy environment. Specifically, cannabidiol is working on the immune system in a big way, and I, that's at the top of the list, where you're going to reduce the number of macrophages that are present in an area. Not so much as to prevent and uh, the protection against infection and to remove de uh, dead material that is toxic to the area, but enough to prevent the recruitment of excessive number of red blood, of uh, white blood cells, of macrophages to the area that would incite additional inflammatory uh, signaling and, and migration. But it's also reducing the number of cytokines that are involved. The numbers, the, the ones that are involved with like tumor necrosis factor, the interleukin-1 and 6, as well as the COX-2 uh, type of enzyme. So it's reducing the pain as well as the signaling and the toxicity that's going on within an injury and within a wound. At the same time, cannabidiol has the ability to restore and rebalance and increase the interleukin-4 and 10, which are your anti-inflammatory cytokines. So it's giving a signal to balance and modulate, restore the positive side of the inflammatory cascade. So we're gonna, re, we're gonna balance the situation and get back to normal. And finally, and, and I mentioned this before, it's not going to prevent uh, any problems with uh, preventing infections. Um, it's not gonna stop uh, the prevention. Uh, this has been shown in um, bone marrow transplant studies and a number of other studies. So this is, has been shown to be effective. Now, one other area I want to mention here, and we tend to overlook this, is reperfusion type of injuries. Now, we think of reperfusion type of injuries are actually as the key problem related to pressure and diabetic ulcers. Now, diabetic ulcers are complicated, but there's certainly a matter of vascular insufficiency to the area, as well as uh, for uh, pressure type of ulcers and um, peripheral vascular insufficiency, um, atherosclerosis that occurs. What happens is when you get a uh, limited blood supply to the area, the, the body is ischemic, there's a reduction in ATP as well as the amount of oxygen that's going to an area. And the body goes into a cascade to try to protect itself and protect the individual cells. But when the blood supply is reperfused, when there's the blood supply returns, the body reacts, it tends to overreact. And that overreaction is the cause for a lot of inflammatory substances, reactive oxygen species, as well um, as... Um, 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 oxygen, high oxygen content, uh, as and also inflammatory substances that are being released into the body. Um, that results into the damage to that occurs with the cells. Now, we see that particularly with brain injury, and you can look at that in terms of somebody has an acute injury and what's the primary therapy and um, as well as for certain types of viral illnesses. It's to put them into a cold situation where they turn down the metabolism so that the body doesn't react with this hyper response and the uh, damage that comes from the reperfusion. If you can pace this out, then you're able to reduce the complications as a result of reperfusion. The same problem is going to be occurring in any ischemic injury, whether that's the kidney or the heart. Uh, classically, we have a heart attack, restriction of blood flow. The real problem is in the reperfusion. It's not so much the injury, unless it's permanent in terms of blood supply, but the reperfusion actually causes more damage, which leads to that membrane damage and the rupture and the cell death in those particular areas. Let me take 
uh, have you take a look at this chart because then you realize that, well, you've got to have reperfusion, otherwise the tissue is going to die just from anoxia. But uh, if you can get past that reperfusion injury phase, uh, that first uh, portion of it, which you would be induced by a cold uh, coma uh, in somebody with a neurologic injury, then you can get back to the healing effects uh, that are going to occur um, in the in entire process. And so there's, it's, that's an important element, especially with the diabetic and the different types of ulcers that we have. I got to tell you that cannabidiol has been um, uh, very prominent in the ability to reduce that ischemic and the reperfusion type of damage that occurs with stroke, with occurs with heart attacks, uh, and it occurs with kidney disease. In each and every case, uh, the cannabidiol was uh, had the ability to protect those tissues against uh, apoptosis, the death of those individual cells. So a great potential for CBD to protect against those types of ulcerations and injuries and enhance the healing process as it goes along. Now, I've got a couple of case studies that I want to relate to you. Uh, this gentleman uh, had a malignant melanoma. Uh, he did a wide excision, and there was a long delay before he was going to get um, that area covered with um, having a, other tissue placed over that and skin uh, transplanted to that area to get that to heal. And as a result of that, um, he had a great deal of pain that was associated with it. He started using cannabidiol. He was taking it orally. He was taking it uh, topically. He put the cannabidiol around the wound areas. And in some cases, he did put the uh, cannabidiol into the wound. Uh, after the, the pain was immediately taken care of. He had uh, no further pain on the area. Uh, and the healing started progressing at record rate. So that over a 12-week course from a a nine centimeter lesion that was wide open and there was no skin grafting that was done to this. This closed up in 12 weeks with no pain and uh, no complications from it. As this time, he does not have any recurrence of the melanoma either. And I've got another case to show you that's along the same lines. Now, this gentleman had a malignant melanoma with a wide excision, um, and this is clearly infected on the left. He's a 78-year-old man um, that had the, ex the excision, uh, but he developed this infection, and it was going to be impossible to um, put on a skin graft because of the infection that was present in here. And, and, of course, he was on antibiotics, but he was making no progress. At this point, the family requested uh, to use uh, my help to start using cannabidiol um, in this process. He was not having any significant pain at the time. So using a cannabidiol both orally and around the wound, um, he was able to heal this wound in 10 weeks with no complications. Um, it was excellent result uh, from uh, the healing process with a steady improvement on the, at the rate of about one centimeter per week. This is extraordinary in terms of the healing process. So what is cannabidiol? Cannabidiol is from cannabis. And there's two types of uh, cannabis. There's marijuana and hemp. Now, CBD comes from the hemp side. Um, it, is, it improves health. It doesn't cause any psychoactive effects. It's safe. It's legal. It's effective. There's no significant reactions that occur with cannabidiol. And there's no toxicity. And there's no significant drug interactions either. It restores the endocannabinoid system. It's really the only thing that we know that works on the whole system. There are other ways. There's diet, there's exercise, uh, there's osteopathic manipulation. There are certain types of light therapy. They all help on the endocannabinoid system. But for CBD, it really kicks it in the butt and gets that going and, and normalizes the levels of the receptors as well as the agonists that are involved. If we're using cannabidiol to help wounds, I recommend starting with a, a standard dose of 15 milligrams twice a day, and that's the oral dose. Adjust it early and boldly to control the symptoms. I want you to find the right dose for that individual. There's such a great deal of variation in individuals about what they need, and it doesn't matter about their body size or their gender or what they've been through. It's a matter of finding what works for them. Because once you start to see the benefits, you start to see the positive changes that occur, then you can be confident that 
the cannabidiol is working on the entire system. There's acute changes that happen with CBD, so people know that they're getting a result, as well as chronic changes in terms of the metabolic changes that are going on uh, within their body. Very positive events that are happening here. Now, I recommend, uh, in terms of different forms, you can use whatever the patient uh, will be interested in using. And then a target dose, about 60 milligrams. I'm thinking of a patient with diabetes, uh, somebody who has a chronic condition that is having some delays. And 60 milligrams is a good target dose. I recommend that for autoimmune diseases and, and many of the inflammatory conditions that I see and encounter. In addition to the oral dose, you can use CBD topically. You can use it around the wound without hesitation, whether it's the oil or the liposome. I prefer the liposomes because that dries. It doesn't maintain an oil, oily condition. The liposomes are water soluble, so they can, uh, are, are easier to use. They can be washed off at a later time. Some of the patients have used this into the wounds, and I have no problem with that because cannabidiol actually has antibacterial properties, antiviral properties, um, and certainly it has the, uh, the effects on inflammation. So you've got a lot of benefits that can come as a result of using cannabidiol around and in a wound. Well, who should be using cannabidiol? Does everybody with a wound need to have uh, CBD? Well, of course not. If, if people are not healing properly, if there are other issues and complications that are going on with that person, or if they have an imp impaired organ function in some manner, then you, and that includes vasculature or diabetes, then you want to use this, uh, the cannabidiol, as uh, part of a maximal support and protection program. Now, other conditions that may be uh, able to use the cannabidiol that, that cannabidiol will help in are the epilepsy and brain injury, the, the Crohn's disease, Alzheimer's, and uh, chronic narcotics. Now, one other thing I want to mention here is that there are particular benefits from using cannabidiol for chronic wounds because of the behavioral effects, the improvement in sleep, um, the improvement in mood and relief of depression. Um, the improvement in activity and the, um, and the reduction or the control perhaps of eating as well as improvement in nutrition that goes on with patients. So the, it's going into the background of patients to help them uh, deal with the difficulty of this particular injury and make their life livable and bearable uh, as well as advancing the healing process. Let's go over uh, what we've talked about today and talk We've, we've mentioned about the huge burden of uh, these types of wounds and that they can have in our society. The endocannabinoid deficiency and its role that it's probably playing in a great many of these problems. And CBD that addresses these critical pathways that I've outlined here. It's supported in preclinical studies and in practice. Unfortunately, we don't have many of the clinical studies except to show that CBD is safe at very high doses without any complications no adverse effects, toxicity, or significant drug interactions. And it's a modest amount of cannabidiol uh, with, uh, with really fast results, those immediate effects as well as the long-term effects. So that's my discussion. I wanted to go over those things with you. I do have references. Uh, the references and notes are located in that uh, a link that I have put together there. A careful copy of that will allow you to download and look at uh, those particular items. And I hope you do. And I appreciate any comments that you would have. You now, at this point, I want to open it up to questions. And you can um, put those questions into the group chat. And I'll be glad to answer whatever questions that you have. Dr. Blair, this is Sandra Park. Can you hear me? Hi, Sandra. Hi. I have not spoken to you in probably almost a year. We exchanged some emails and then spoke regarding my son. Yeah. Are you angry at me? No, no. I just, what you're, what you're saying today, we're seeing um, fleshed out with Aaron as his gut has been able to heal. We've been able to be consistent with um, an elixinol protocol that I muscle test for him pretty much every day. Um, we've been able to be consistent since last November. Sandra, your son has a panda, is that right? 
pandas and autism spectrum issues and encephalitis and it's just been this crazy mix of diagnosis yeah and so i believe it, it his immune system and his gut are benefiting so much and i just i have had every intention to, to reconnect with you and let you know and life keeps happening so i just had a moment now and i feel like this fits with what you're speaking about tonight as far as um, the internal wounds of the, of the gut. It's just giving things a tincture of time because he was in Children's Hospital of Colorado for two months. They did a total med flush on him. When we got him home and had a cleaner slate without so many things complicating his picture, we resumed um, the Elixir products. But it has definitely taken perseverance. Even though we saw some improvements pretty early on, it's just been, it's been slow and steady. You know, I, I certainly reflect that. I, I have seen that as well, that with um, people with complex problems like your son, uh, it's not a matter of this is the pill and it's, it's, it's a struggle. You have to balance a number of different factors that are involved and it's quite complicated. So I appreciate what you've been through and your perseverance in holding to this course. Well, I appreciate just knowing that you guys are there and the wonderful products. And in his case, he because I have the ability to muscle test him and really see what his body is wanting, what has been so, um, I think, eye-opening to me <clears throat> is that he's moved through phases where we've used everything. Um, we, the only thing he hasn't done, we haven't, he hasn't vaped anything, but we do use the, the Respira um, sublingually with him now but it it just seems like that there's so much that still may be unknown about these products and how they're working but the, 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 at the end of the day they are working i don't care so much how that's your job <laughs> but well, they're working and the proof is in the pudding here at the parks household so thank you and i just want to encourage anybody else out there that's um you know working with complicated complicated clients and patients and family members.